gentlemen, colleagues, Sanjay, thank you for, for organizing this. Uh, a pleasure to meet a distinguished panel and certainly people who have a lot more um, profound thoughts to say on the future of multilateralism than, than I ever will be able to conjure. But um, look, um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very important topic and, and asked at the right time. Um, the quick answer that I would give to the question the future of multilateralism is that is uh, depends which bit of it you mean. Um, and I know we have uh, specialists on WTO in this panel who will um, address uh, the issues of, of trade and globalization. But uh, since uh, um, AJ and I um, come, or part of our lives at least, comes from the UN, I think I'm best qualified to address the multilateralism issue as far as the UN is concerned. And, and let's take a, um, a second and, and um, set the background of where we are um, and why we're discussing this issue because we certainly, I think, collectively feel that uh, multilateralism is under threat. Um, we are obviously in a global geopolitical shift that started about 10 years ago. Um, I think it was not evident to wide audiences until literally in the last two, three years, even though the shift was there and the more discerning and profound thinkers were pointing to that shift. Um, I think it's now just a shift from a um, dual polar world to a single polar world to now a multipolar world, but it's also a shift away from the north and uh, certainly to Asia, so to the east and to the south in every area you can think about, whether it's economic, um, um, increasingly social and cultural, uh, certainly political, security, uh, military, you, you, can, you can look at it and, and you can probably discern a shift in any of these areas if you care to try. Um, the second issue that characterizes our, um, our moment in time and this global shift is the breakdown of the rules. Multilateralism, by definition, was created in order to develop and cement a certain game book of the rules of the road. And it did that successfully after the Second World War, and then it was frozen by the Cold War, and then it was unfrozen by the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Everything in this world seems to be connected to walls. Um, and, and now it is, it is shifting again because the old order, which usually changes historically every 50 or 80 years, um, is now happening. Now, the rules of the road that were pre-agreed, like in diplomacy, I mean, diplomats know that when you send the note verbale, you know, later than 30 days after the incoming, that's a signal you're sending to your counterpart and your opponent. There's an issue with the contents of the matter. Those types of rules of the road, I think, disappeared. Um, I think, certainly, the area, the, the, the issues that characterized the last 20, 25 years, um, and were largely imposed by, by the developed North, um, have um, come under question. I think the globalization, and I'm, I'm sure the colleagues, when speaking on trade and globalization, will, will, will come to this, but globalization was moved forward as an instrument of fair competition by the developed northern countries. It is interesting that 30 years later, it is the South that primarily won from globalization, and India and China and other countries in Asia are definitely the winners from that process. But what has happened over the last five to ten years is the perception in the North started being that we're losing from globalization. And I think that brought the whole system into, into, um, into conflict. And I think the clearest definition of that was over the last 12 months with the arrival of the Trump administration that suddenly decided to put under question all the multilateral and bilateral and, and regional agreements that were either in force or, or were about to be concluded, whether in Asia or in Europe, transatlantic, transpacific, um, and including questioning the basis on, on which we operate in, in, in globalization and trade. Um, I think another um, element that characterizes our time 
is certainly the question whether the multilateral system is up for the challenges of the 21st century. And while the financial institutions have come under threat and, and are adapting, look at the reform of the IMF, look at the creation of the new instruments, whether it's the new bank or the Asian Infrastructure Bank, but I think the one that's come under the biggest threat is certainly the UN. Um, the perception, in large measure correct, um, is that it is a system that was created in 1945 as an outcome of, of the Second World War. It was created by the, victim, uh, by the victors in the war, um, and the rest of the world just had to line up and play according to that rule book that was largely created in, in, in the late 40s, which again is largely correct. I mean, India has a particular issue with the UN, primarily because of the Security Council reform. It is not alone. Um, I frankly don't know of any, any single colleague in the UN who actually thinks India shouldn't be in the Security Council. But I think the challenge, like with every, any reform in the UN, and, and we're going through a number of these reforms now, I'm sure people in the audience and in the panel are well, well aware of what the Secretary General is proposing. But uh, um, like many of these reforms, they, they are not done bit by bit. There has to be a wide-reaching consensus about how it can happen. And that consensus is difficult to, to arrive by. But I, I don't think anybody's questioning that in, in, in the foreseeable future, India and a number of other countries will certainly become members of the Security Council. But, but here, coming back to the main kind of topic of today's discussion, the future of multilateralism, I think one needs to also point out that, that most audiences and most viewers of, 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 and readers of newspapers and viewers of, of TV programs largely see the UN as the, as the bulwark of the multilateral system in, in a very kind of haphazard and partial way. What is most often in, in newspapers and, and, and TV programs is of course the Security Council, issues of peace and security and conflict. And most often it is, um, quote unquote, the failure of the UN to prevent, um, or the failure of the UN to react, or the failure of the UN to deploy. And, and while factually um, these statements are largely correct, when these conversations start among colleagues and, and, and friends of mine or in settings like this, I actually say, well, I'm sorry, but the UN is exactly what you want it to be. Um, because by definition we're a product of a system created, okay, initially by a small group of countries, but India was one of the founding members, but very much today shaped by all 193 countries where consensus by definition, like in a, in a very kind of dysfunctional democracy, is very difficult to achieve. And there are groupings, and there are special interests, and there are lobbyists, and there are big power plays, and, and of course the the, the, the big game is being played on the UN stage, which makes even the reform of Security Council to invite India and a number of others to be a, a, a legitimate full-time member is a difficult process to um, to. But the UN is much more than that. And uh, I'm, I'm married to, to a British citizen, and so it's not surprising, I think, to any of you that we constantly have uh, family discussions about Brexit. And, uh, and I think um, it, it came to me that I should compare this, this to, to the Brexit moment where, you know, Brexit was sold to the British public as, you know, if we come out 300 million, we'll go into the, into the public health system. And kind of nobody thought of anything else. And suddenly, as the discussion developed over the months and now years since, since the referendum in, in the UK, it became apparent that Airplanes may not be able to fly, uh, trains may not be able to cross, legislation and, and you know, how we decide between domestic law and, and European law is going to be a big issue. Suddenly we discovered that uh, all kinds of sectors that we never thought were at all even linked to our membership at the European Union suddenly come under threat. And I only list this example because it's exactly the same thing, only a lot more, with the system of multilateralism. It is difficult for us to imagine that things as simple as meteorological surveys and, and how we register weather and calibration of different scales 
were established by a process of international law, and a large part of it was done under the UN umbrella and the World Meteorological Organization. We wouldn't be able to govern the, to govern the Arctic because there is a forum where the Arctic countries meet and discuss the future of how to behave in the Arctic. We wouldn't be able to trade. Containers would not be able to cross borders. Many other things would not be able to happen because that is the phenomenon of international law and international systems. Once we create them and things start working, everybody forgets that they exist because life becomes so convenient. It's when they break down, then the realization of, oh, we actually need a multilateral system, suddenly descends on us, and the biggest losers from the breakout of that system are the countries that actually are most global in their perspective, and their outreach, and their trade, in their strategic partnership relationships, and everything else. So, I think the Brexit example is a very ample um, pretext of how to answer the question of today's debate. I personally think that the future of multilateralism is incredibly bright. And the more we move temporarily into a state of semi-chaos and the road where no rules exist, the more we will crave a return to a new rule-based system developed with a lot more participatory um, discussion among member states and among all the countries in the world and continents widely represented, let's say, in the UN Security Council by a by a G20, not necessarily by the G20, but certainly widely represented with key regional powers and or um, organizations leading in particular regions, um, being having been given a voice there as well as in many other forums. How long will it take us to get to that system? Look, it's difficult to, to predict given the chaos we're, we're experiencing today, um, given the fact that um, the whole system, not only of multilateral operation, but also the financial mechanisms underpinning it, has come under tremendous stress. Um, I don't know that today there is a consensus among countries on how to fund AUN or other multilateral institutions and what that should look like. But I think it's, it is a question of 10 years before we arrive at a new system and provided, of course, we don't have an apocalyptic uh, uh, event of it, man-made or naturally designed. Um, but I think it will take about 10 years to settle. Um, what is the UN going to be doing in this 10 years? Well, look, I mean, the, 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 the UN is, is frequently rightly criticized for, for a number of things. Um, and I think that criticism should be shared equally between the member states and the organization itself. But certainly, um, the fragmentation of the UN, um, certainly the difficulty in making decisions and enforcing action um, is there on the table. I think the Secretary General's reform agenda, of which, by the way, the Indian government is strongly and widely supportive. There are questions to be answered and there are issues to be clarified, but India is very much kind of on the side of the reform scenario. But it will take some time um, and and the UN will need to reform. The one area in the UN that I'm not sure actually has a, a long-term positive outlook is interestingly enough my area, uh, which is kind of the development um, uh, side of the UN. Because I think with the emergence of countries like China and India and increasing number of middle-income countries, there is a still need for a certain set of services and policies and exchanges of experiences and the neutrality of the blue flag to be there. But I think it is certainly not the agenda of 30, 40, 60 years ago where the South was in dire need of a transfer of resources, technical expertise and, and, um, and technologies. So let me wrap here and say, the, to summarize, I believe the future outlook is very, very bright for multilateralism. I don't think anybody can predict today how will it look. I think if we destroy the UN, we'll have to create a same or a similar um, thing in its place because there's no other uniquely legitimate platform that allows the world to talk to each other. But on the development pillar, I think there is a question mark which will start to be answered in the coming six to nine to 12 months because we are waiting 
come for the member states to come back to us and say, well, in the 2030 agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals and in the Paris Agreement, this is what we need from the EU, the UN, and please deliver it ASAP, and by the way, here's the model and the money to do it with. Um, let me stop here and, and listen to the other speakers.